I brought my little, uh, my little book. Nice, nice. <laughs> but I guess um, we'll do introductions first. So I'm John from uh, Prompt Player. Uh, Prompt Player is a, a tool for collaborative iteration, evaluation, and observability for uh, prompt engineering. And uh, Rogo happens to be one of our customers. So we have uh, Tomas here from there. I'll let him explain what they do there, and then we'll get into the questions. Sounds great. Um, so Rogo is a financial research platform for public markets investors, investment banks, and private equity. Um, the main core focus of Rogo is to center trust, make sure that when you are making billions of dollars of, uh, or you're trading billions of dollars of assets, that every number that goes into the, you know, any one of those trades is heavily audited and trustworthy. The same process that happens in finance. So working to automate that workflow, add trust, and yeah, that's the main core. Using LLMs and prompt player to get that done. Exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so I think I, I want to focus this conversation a little bit because uh, Tomas talked about trust. We're going to talk a little bit about evaluations. Um, so what are uh, some evaluation metrics Rogo is looking at right now? Yeah, so a lot of this process, and I think like, you know, any end user application like Rogo always has to focus on the actual out output that comes from the user and how often are users, you know, using your product? Are they going, you know, are they asking 20 questions in a row? Are they using the LLM very, very commonly? Like that's a sign of really, really good success. But to start even getting to that point, you know, you have to come up with, and you're designing the system, you have to come up with, you know, empirical metrics to build a data set, you know, build a, you know, a test data set to be able to evaluate your metrics on you know, like any type of metric on, you know, RAG, any type of metric on, you know, how much you're hallucinating, coming up with those systems to then, you know, build your system and, you know, continuously deploy it to production. Once it's deployed in production, then you see how users are actually using it, if they are really getting a lot of value out of this next new, new deployment, and then, you know, continuously iterating it. And, you know, what, one thing that we really use Player for is Player allows you to have versions inside the prompt registry. We're heavy users of the prompt registry. And one thing that you can do is you can set um, one of the tags to be from staging to production. And so as we're building out our um, you know, prompts and we're iterating continuously on how we actually you know, call the LLMs, um, then we actually are able to switch the best um, you know, version of that into production using Prompt Player's registry. Yeah, for sure. That's a feature we just released recently. So <laughs> happy to hear that uh, you guys are using it. Um, I guess something you touched upon, which I think is, is very interesting for a very technical group that we have here, is uh, the place of um, formal statistical methods when talking about evaluation versus more uh, anecdotal, customer-driven uh, type metrics. D like, do you have a good mental model of how, you know, I think uh, the second Elon uh, spoke about like how we're not in the big leagues yet, right? We don't really have these defined metrics of certain scores and stuff like that that we could look at. And I actually personally think it's kind of funny how we all look at using LLMs to evaluate themselves. I think that is probably powerful, but to me it, it kind of indicates the, a little bit of the immaturity of where we are at, at a field. But how, how do you guys look at both you know, these empirical versus anecdotal types of evaluation when it comes to figuring out how well your product's doing? Totally, and to be in full transparency, like um, LLMs are not great at um, evaluating all types of you know output that you've gotten out of there. So, for example, in finance, like you know, if you end up hallucinating one small number out of you know a, a filing or earnings transcript or any type of internal document, and that ends up going into you know production, some person is making you know a trade and putting that into a slide deck that then goes and then ends up being completely invalidated. Now they're going to lose trust. They might you know buy a product at a wrong multiple and. You know, they're, you know they're, they're taking a bath, so to speak. Um, and at the same time, you know, they could be missing out on an amazing opportunity because they're just being fed incorrect information. Um, and so the way that I think, you know, you have to start is by thinking of, and, you know, generally, you know, with finance, you have so many, so much information, so much documents that you have to use um, RAG. And RAG, I think, is one of the best ways in which you are seeing a lot of the theory that goes behind recommender systems actually being used now. Um, because you know, not every product, the same way not every product on Amazon has a rating by every user on Amazon, you know, not in the, in like the space of every possible query, um, you know, that isn't a perfect match for every possible document. 
And so you have this incredibly sparse world in which you are trying to you know, find and rank the best documents inside like this, you know, this matrix of queries and documents. And you know, coming up with hypothetical documents is a really good idea. Um, Jerry has incredible um, webinars, of which like, I've watched like three times over, of just how, um, you know, they, how to boost drag. And you, know, you have to come up, and you know, human evaluation at, at its core is like a big part. And so at Rogo, what we do is you know, we first um, you know, iterate on our, you know, rag and uh, prompt level, um, you know, layers. And as we're moving on in this iteration, we then actually do have a human evaluation step, which is, you know, I used to work in finance, so I'm decent at doing human evaluation in the same way as other people that work at Rogo um, that are ex-finance. And they're able to actually make sure and, like, duly check to make sure that, like, any one of these metrics works. As for actual empirical methods, um, you know, since you are treating RAG as a recommender system, a lot of the theory actually applies there. So looking at mean reciprocal rank um, and the, all of the you know, map and um, net cumulative discounted gain, um, all of those different metrics to evaluate how rank, like rank aware evaluation metrics are really, really useful for RAG. Um, and once those, you know, once that context gets injected into the prompt, then you actually have the, a second layer of evaluating um, you know, whether this is a hallucination or not and stuff like that. And for that, I think the best way in which we were able to actually improve performance is by using GPT functions for, um, as, as a classifier. But it's not just that. It's also by ensembling them. And so ensembling is, again, making five concurrent LLM calls with the exact same context and taking the majority vote of those. Not five, but maybe like 100 if you, you know, have your own um, you know, GPU cluster where you're running you know, a simple hugging face model on it. Um, and that really, really helps because now you're, do, and you're taking a majority vote of like the possible um, like classification and that way you're able to raise it. As, as soon as you're able to raise the temperature and you're able to like see the actual you know, classical evaluation metrics of you know, the... Um, of the uh, you know, classification system you just built with ensembling, that's how you're able to really get really, really good performance. And then you're able to push that into production. That, that's uh, fairly interesting and, and fairly sophisticated. I actually didn't know you guys were, were going that complicated. When, when you're looking at this, just to like double click on that, do you guys uh, look at it like as a black box and like have some form of binary yes or no or score that you're like this request slash response pair performed you know, 85 on the scale, or are you guys not really at that stage or splitting it up into different pieces and looking at it that way? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we do measure it um, at a level, at a layer level. I don't, I'm not sure we do it at the exact granularity as Arise and their spans do. Um, but we, we definitely, um, you know, are, are going toward that direction. I think, like, the, the best way to sort of, you know, start about building a system that's really production ready and production grade is to sort of just like, you know, be scientific about it. Build a test set, build what kinds of questions and what kinds of experiences do you want your users to have and work backwards from them. Once you have 100 of those, as, as soon as you're iterating on it, make sure that you're not um, regressing back. Because regression, you know, like just because you, you can look at some output and be like, oh, this is awesome, now we can answer these types of questions, you know, that's another thing. One metric I really, really like is, um, out of like, once you have user data and once you actually have people really, really using your product is getting and encouraging users to like continuously make LLM calls and really, really interact with your product and interact with, you know, um, you know the cool thing that is generative AI. And my favorite metric for that is to take the average queries per session and see how many times a user is in like the 90th, 95th percentile of those. And once you're at that point, once you're seeing that they're like really, really like, you're encouraging these binges where they're just continuously calling, um, you know, Rogo in our case, but continuously calling, um, you know, your production, uh, you know, system. That's when you really, really know yeah. you're good. I have a like random question about that. How do you know that if they're like asking questions over and over again, that that's a positive signal and not a negative signal that they're like pissed off? Oh no, you know, you're right. It could be that, but it's the fact that like if they're pissed off, they'll go to Google and they'll go somewhere else, right? Like that's right. like you, there are many different places you can find information on the internet. Um, but the fact that they are doing that, and obviously, like you know, if they, if they export it out, and Rogo is really, really built into um, you know financial workflows, that's how you're really, um, you know, once they export it out, that's when you know you're at a good place. Right. That's that's when you know you're in business. So then, on, on that, talking more from a product perspective and a customer perspective, you, the stakes are, are fairly high for Rogo. It's not like ChatGPT. You guys are doing financial data where uh, any hallucination could be costly both for the company and also your relationship with them. So how do you guys like approach that? Uh, is it UX? Is it education? Is it 
engineering? What, what, what's the, the tackle? Yeah, I mean, look, honestly, like, to some extent, we're still figuring that out. But the main way we do it is by setting user expectations and by um, making sure that like, we are continuously working to improve the product with the users. Um, a lot of that goes with good onboarding, teaching them how to prompt better. Um, we've, we've introduced a prompt library where users can share really good prompts inside um, our system. And I think that's a pretty good idea for like, a lot of chatbot applications um, where you, know, you can share different types of prompts between users and you can kind of, inf like, you know, have this emergent behavior where you're having collaboration. Um, a lot of that, you know, really, really helps. Um, and also just like being in like close contact, we use Intercom and a bunch of these other, um, you know, really, really helpful tools to. Right. I, I guess on that um, slightly more uh, philosophical question, uh, Rogo is a chat interface, right? It's, it's main people are interacting. Yeah. The, there's a chat interface and then there's a, um, like a semantic search. Or we basically just have our entire rag stack available for anyone that wants to do search inside our document system. It's the same way if I, finance people have ever used BAMSEC. That's mm. more what we've done, but we've also added you know, our, our entire rag application behind it. Right, so on that topic, when you look at like say the uh, evolution of something like ChatGPT, where at the beginning everybody was throwing their code questions into ChatGPT, and then now you have things like uh, Cursor, and um, I just saw Google release something like that, where it's much more in context help. Do you see that happening in general in this space, or like there is going to be, like chat is going to, to, to stay with us for a long time? Um, I do think that chatbots generally are the the first step of a lot of this, a lot of uh, like ML waves of interest. Um, I think that's been sort of the case for a lot, um, just the history of you know natural language processing. But um, you know, I do think that a lot of chat applications are really cool. Um, like I use ChatGPT every day, um, and it's just a really really helpful workflow tool you can use. Um, I do think that you're right, and a lot of like, the being able to orchestrate different types of uses of LLMs to create really intelligent results. And how that gets synthesized back to the user as a streamed, you know, response is going to be, it's going to change a lot over time. And I'm actually curious to hear your answer to that question, and prompt player customers. Yeah, I think for us, we see uh, with the bigger customers that we have coming through our door, they already have a product, a functionality, and and they want to use uh, LLMs there. So some of them will come and try to go with chat, but that might be a little bit overwhelming. Uh, UX is a little bit complicated. What are you exactly going to chat with? Um, so we see those companies are building small features in their product that use LMs. The more the younger generation, the new people that are coming in, they're definitely much more like chat focused as that's like a very easy way to go in. Um, I, I guess wh while we're here, uh, I'll ask you one question about uh, Rogo and, and our relationship with Prompt Player. How are you guys using Prompt Player uh, to kind of work as a team? Yeah, so I think like well, the one thing that, and I think you, I'd love to hear you talk more about this too, is that I don't think prompts are necessarily code. Um, a lot of things that you could do with prompts and a lot of the ways that you really get iterate on working with prompts are just um, you know publishing the latest version of it and then quickly testing and running a lot of evaluations in parallel just to make sure that like you know you're generally right and then quickly like iterating and you know not making sure that you're not regressing and moving forward and, and you know getting there um, and so like that's one that's the biggest way in which we use prompt player is being able to measure versions from the registry making being able to encourage collaboration with our within our organization um, around prompting because a lot of people can do prompting um, but it takes a while for them to really get on like re really get a good sense of what's doing well um, the other really really nice use case that we use with prompt player is being able to measure our open AI costs and open AI latency but all of that is very very nice to, to measure as well.